As usual, we start off with the vocabulary section. And our first word, actually two words, is flowering plant. Now, you know what a flower is, right? We have a nice picture of many flowers here. And flowers are, of course, there are many colors, many different kinds. Those are flowers. And then we, you, of course, you know what a plant is. But here we're combining the two words and we're using ing. So flowering, we're changing the flower, which is a noun, we're changing it into an adjective. So this whole word is now an adjective to describe what kind of plant is it? Well, a flowering plant, what kind of plant? It's a plant which produces flowers. So not all plants produce or create or make flowers. Only certain types of plants do, and we call those plants flowering plants. Okay. Next, we have conifer. Conifer. Now, you probably have seen many conifers, especially if you live in uh, the northern part or the southern parts of the world. There are not too many conifers in the hot uh, regions around the equator. It depends also, of course, on your altitude. But anyway, a conifer is a tree that produces seeds inside cones. If you've seen a pine cone, pine cones are probably the most famous, most common, but inside the pine cone, there are seeds inside there. And the pine cone will fall off the tree, the seeds will fall out. Well, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but the seeds are protected by the cone. And of course, many people use those cones for decorations in the winter time. But if you live in the northern areas or in an area where there's a lot of snow, there are many conifers. Pine trees, for example, are a very famous type of conifer. Next we have moss. Now moss grows on rocks, usually rocks. Could grow on buildings too, of course, concrete. But it's a small, it's a small green plant that grows in wet areas. Moss needs water and uh, usually a lot of water in the air to grow. Water in the air we call, by the way, is humidity. Humidity. So if there's a lot of humidity in the climate, there's a good chance that moss will grow. And moss is just that green uh, plant that grows on rocks. It also grows on trees. And in fact, it's interesting. When I was growing up, I grew up in the American West, and people said, if you want to know directions like north, south, east, and west, there's a common saying that goes like this, moss always grows on the north side of the tree. Why would moss grow on the north side of the tree? Well, in the American West, that's north of the equator. So the sun is over here, the tree is here. The sun is at the equator, that's south, because you're in the northern hemisphere. So the sun doesn't really touch the northern part of the tree. So in the morning when there's a lot of humidity in the air, the water stays on the north part of the tree longer. So that's better conditions for the moss to grow there. The moss doesn't really grow on the south side of the tree because the sun will dry that side of the tree out. There's, you know, it's too dry. There's not enough water. So instead the moss will grow on the north side of the tree. So, you know, that's kind of an interesting thing that I learned. It's not, you know, it depends on, on where you are, of course. Uh, it's better to use a compass, but it's a common saying, moss grows on the north side of a tree. So if you don't want to know which direction is north, look for the moss. Okay. That will show you which way north is. Anyway. Fern. Now, if you live in, again, a cool but humid environment, and I'm thinking about the Pacific Northwest, Oregon, Washington State, uh, Northern California, a place where there are, it's kind of cool, but there's a lot of water in the air, it's humid, and there's also a lot of trees uh, covering so the sun doesn't really dry out the ground very much, you'll see a lot of ferns. And ferns are green plants with long stems and thin leaves. It's a perfect picture of them. And I, I, of course, wherever you live, you might see ferns. They usually grow on the ground 
in a forest, trees around, not too many trees because they need to have sunlight, but that's where they usually grow. And you can, you can hide in the ferns, right? Uh, your dog probably likes to play in the ferns, but usually ferns will occur in cool rain forests. Okay. Spore. What is a spore? Well, you know what seeds are. Many plants produce seeds, and if you eat an apple, you can see the seed. But some plants don't create seeds. They create spores. And a spore is a tiny reproductive. Reproductive means a new organism can grow from it. Of course, a seed, if you have an apple, apple, an apple seed, a new apple tree can grow from the seed. Well, a new fern can grow from a fern spore. Uh, reproductive bodies of ferns and mosses similar to the seeds of other plants. So, ferns and mosses, they don't create seeds, they create spores. Next, we have contain. Contain means to have something inside an object. So, there's a very good example. That's a good picture. You know, there's a seed inside the avocado, but we can also talk about, you know, contain doesn't just mean natural things. This, I have a water bottle. It's a plastic water bottle. This plastic water bottle, what's inside it? Water. So, the plastic bottle contains water. It's to have something inside of an object. Okay, that means to contain. So, an avocado will contain a big avocado seed. Okay, avocados are good for making guacamole, by the way. Okay, good. Anyway, contain. Maple. Now, Canada is famous for their maple trees. Maple trees grow in northern climates where it's cooler, and they have big leaves. They have really large leaves. Maple leaves have uh, maple leaves are quite large, and they turn red or yellow in the fall. So when it gets colder and it's going to be winter soon, the maple leaves they're very large. They're not. They're not. They're useless during the winter because there's not a lot of sun. So the trees. Tree, you know, if the tree could think, it's thinking, I don't need my leaves in the winter. It's just wasted energy. So the leaves will die. And as they die, they turn red or yellow. Very beautiful in the fall. But then they fall off the, the branches. And in the spring, new leaves will grow. So a maple tree is a tree with large leaves that turn red or yellow in fall. And maple trees are also famous for making syrup that you put on your pancakes. Yum, yum. Okay, so good. That's a maple tree. Okay, those are our words for this lesson. American Textbook Reading Science Book 4 Lesson 1 Grouping Plants Flowering plant. A plant which produces flowers. Conifer. A tree that produces seeds inside cones. Moss. A small green plant that grows in wet areas. Fern. A green plant with long stems and thin leaves. Spore. One of the tiny reproductive bodies of ferns and mosses, similar to the seeds of other plants. Contain. To have something inside an object. Maple. A tree with large leaves that turn red or yellow in fall.
As usual, we start with the vocabulary, and you may have noticed a difficult word in the unit title, how seeds are scattered. Well, what does scatter mean? Scatter means to throw or drop objects over an area, usually a wide area. Think about your room, right? If you come home and you take off your clothes, you know, you change from your school clothes to your home comfortable clothes, and how do you do it? Do you just throw your shirt over there, maybe your pants over there, your belt over there? You scatter your clothes all over the room, okay? Hopefully, don't do that. Mom doesn't like it, right? So, but to scatter is to throw objects or things in a wide area not very neatly. Like the picture shows, we see seeds are just tossed on the ground randomly. Okay. Next, we have blow. <sighs> right? How strong can you blow? If you're young, you can blow really strongly. Usually, if you have a birthday cake, you have many candles on your cake, and you blow them out. We believe that if you blow out all the candles in one blow, your wish will come true. So, to blow is to make something move by a current of air. Of course, we blow, but it, blowing doesn't mean that a person or an animal has to do it. It could just happen in nature naturally from the wind, right? If there's a strong wind, the wind blows. And we have a video to show what's going on here. Also, this is very important because as you can see, the boy, he's blowing on a flower. And I just want to point this out before we watch the video. What kind of flower is that? That is called a dan, oops, sorry. D-A-N, dandelion. It's not a lion, it's a dandelion. A dandelion is that type of flower. Let's watch a video of the dandelion being blown in the wind. Here we go. There's the dandelion. Let's watch as the wind blows it. Okay, here we go. There's the wind. The wind comes along and blows it. Now what happened? All these little things here, oh, actually you see these little pieces here? Those are seeds, right? The wind comes along and blows the dandelion seeds and they are scattered, okay? And that's how the plant reproduces itself because new plants will grow. By the way, it's very interesting that people will say dandelions, you can predict the weather by looking at the dandelion. If it's nice weather, the dandelion has a nice ball shape like we saw at the beginning of the video. But if, it's, if there's high humidity, it's going to rain, then the petals of the dandelion close up over the flower. So if you see that, you say, oh, it's going to rain. Interesting. Okay. Next word is land. Now, if something is flying in the air, like a dandelion seed that's blowing in the wind, after a while the wind will stop or get weaker and the dandelion seed will come down and touch back onto land, onto land, and then we say that it lands. So land is a noun, right? It's the, the, the ground that you stand on, but land is also a verb because we use it to say that something that was flying comes back to the ground. So to come to the ground after moving in the air, to come back to the ground, to land. Okay. Next we have ripe. Ripe is an important word, especially if you're going to eat fruit or other types of plants or vegetables, right? Ripe. Ripe means that it is fully grown and ready to eat. So you don't want to eat an unripe apple. Ugh, that doesn't taste very good. You want to eat a ripe apple or a ripe orange or ripe corn. Whatever the plant is that you eat, it should be ripe. That means it's fully grown and it is ready to eat. Our next word is stick. Now, stick has a couple of different meanings. Of course, you can say, I have a stick, right? You have a tree branch and you wave it around. That's a noun, but we're not talking about that definition here. Stick here 
is a verb. It's a verb in this definition. It means for one object to become attached to another. And you can see in this picture, oh, you pr you're probably familiar with this situation. You walk in the woods or you walk in a grassy area where there's a lot of plants and after you go through you look down at your pants or your socks especially and you see these little things that are sticking to your socks or your pants and of course that's what it means to stick to to attach to something tape is sticky right if you want to stick two things together use a piece of tape if or glue glue is also sticky so stick can be used as a noun it can be used as a verb it can also be used as an adjective sticky it is sticky glue is sticky tape is sticky parts of plants are sticky they will stick to you okay next Drop. Drop, of course, just means to let something fall or, or to fall by itself. Of course, it's a verb. If you just let go of something, it will drop. Of course, when the earlier example we looked at with the dandelion seeds, they're flying in the wind. The wind is blowing, so the dandelion seed is, is flying in the air. What happens when the wind stops? Whoop, the dandelion seed drops to the ground. It lands, okay? So to drop means to fall from the air, or fall from a, a high place down to a lower place. It can mean to land if the object winds up on the ground, okay? So there's different kinds of landings. There's good landings and not so good landings. Okay, anyway, to drop. Burr. Now, we talked about stick. Remember when we saw that picture for stick? We saw those little pieces of the plant that sticks to your socks. They're really hard to get out, aren't they? Well, what part of the plant is that? We call that a burr. Burr. Burr are little hooks on a seed that can stick to things. And of course, many plants will do this. They'll have the little tiny hooks, very small, but if you look at them carefully, especially with a magnifying glass, you can see that the little parts of the uh, part of the plant, they're like little hooks, and those hooks grab on to your clothing, and they really like socks, but also pants, and they'll grab onto those and stick with you as you move. So burr is little hooks on a seed that can stick to things and those are the things that are on your socks or your pants and your shoes okay fur well first we had burr now we have fur er the ending sound of r burr fur in this case fur of course is the hair that covers some animals Okay, uh, I've got kind of hairy arms, but don't call this fur, right? It's not that thick. I don't have that much hair. But if it's a really a lot of hair growing really close together and you cannot see the skin, we call that fur. Look at your dog. Maybe you have a pet dog or a cat or a mouse. That, if you look at the animal, they have very thick hair growing out of their skin. We call that fur. Fur, it's the hair that covers some animals. Not all animals, but many animals, especially mammals, have fur, but not humans. We don't have fur, so don't, don't say that about a human being. It's not nice. Okay, <laughs> anyway, good. Okay, so those are our words for the lesson. Lesson 2. How Seeds Are Scattered Scatter. To throw or drop objects over an area. Blow. To make something move by a current of air. Land. To come to the ground after moving in the air. Ripe. Fully grown and ready to eat. Stick. For one object to become attached to another. Drop. To fall or to let something fall. 
Burr. Little hooks on a seed that can stick to things. Fur. The hair that covers some animals. As usual, we start with the vocabulary. Our first word today is ant eater. This is actually two words, as you can see. Ant, right? Little,、uh, I think you say gamey in Korean, little, little ants running around. And then eater. So it's an interesting word. Something that eats ants, okay? So ant eater is an animal that has a long nose. And eats ants. And this is a good picture of an anteater. It's a really strange looking animal, isn't it? But it's a very、uh, unique and amazing animal, as all animals are, actually. Okay, let's move on. Tongue. Tongue, of course, is the soft, movable part in your mouth. I would show you mine, but it seems a little rude to stick your tongue out at another person. So don't do that. <laughs> We can see a picture of a frog. A frog has a very famous tongue and a very interesting tongue. We can see the tongue of the frog here. Well, look at how long that is. And the, the frog can flick, can flick its tongue out or throw its tongue out at an insect far away from the frog and catch it because the tongue is sticky. So the frog uses its tongue to catch its food, insects. Very interesting. Underground. Underground. Of course, we live above ground. We don't usually say above ground because that's normal for us. But if we go under the ground, that's a little odd. So we say underground. And again, we have another word that has two words. Of course, we call these types of words compound words. Compound words because compound is when you take two or more things and you join them together to make one thing. And we've joined two words under and ground to make one word, and that means, of course, below the ground. If you use the subway in your city, you travel underground, unless your subway comes up sometimes above ground. But usually the subway, sub means under, way is path. Subway is another compound word, but subway would be under the ground, right? Usually under the ground. And many animals, of course, live underground. Ants, worms, looks like a caterpillar or some kind of grub. And then,、um, Looks like a mole.、Uh, and other animals will live underground. They make their homes in the ground, underground. Okay. Spray. To spray is to blow liquid into the air. And of course, mom uses something, or dad, of course,、uh, will use a cleaner, you know, and it sprays. You, you、uh, have a little trigger here. You push the trigger, and it sprays the cleaning liquid onto the glass or the kitchen countertop or something like that. Be careful also because、um, when you speak, you also spray your spit from your mouth. And that's why it's a good idea to wear a mask. When people are worried about catching diseases, right? So, spray is just、uh, to blow liquid into the air, whether it's normally through your mouth while you're talking or through a, a spray bottle when you're cleaning something, but to spray. Okay. Adapt. Adapt means to change. To change in order to be successful in a new situation. So let's say you change schools. Your family moves from one city to another. Or even better, your family moves from one country to another.、Oh, that's a better example because when you move to the new country, maybe they're speaking a new language. They have different customs. They have、uh, different ways to dress, different, maybe different clothes. You have to change、uh, your behavior. 
your speech and the way that you act probably to adapt to the new situation, the new environment in which you live. And animals, living creatures, do this all the time because the environment is always changing around us. So we adapt to our environment, adapt to change. And of course, we want to be successful. If we don't change, we won't be successful, right? Some people say change or die. Okay, that's, that's a natural law, right? Uh, so if uh, living creatures don't change, many of them will die. They have to change to be successful in their new environment. Next we have, oh, is a big word, a little bit difficult, right? Wow, how do you pronounce that? Camouflage, camouflage. Camouflage is an interesting word. It's an interesting idea too. Take a look at this picture. It's an interesting lizard, right? It looks like an iguana. But um, some lizards and some frogs and other animals also will be able to change their color. And, you know, change their color, I don't mean like over a long period of time, I mean right away. Like uh, this type of lizard, frogs can do this. Octopus, if you ever see an octopus underwater, they're amazing. The color is, you know, uh, like pulsing on their skin as you watch them and they're blending in. Camouflage is basically an animal's color or sometimes the shape of the animal also makes it hard to see it in nature. It's hard to see this lizard because it can change the color of its skin to the same color of the tree on which it sits. Frogs can do this too, some frogs, and like I said, octopus. If you ever look at an octopus moving over a coral reef, you know, the coral reef has many different colors, and the octopus changes so it matches the colors as it moves over the reef. It's really amazing. So that is camouflage. Sometimes people will wear camouflage, right? They'll wear a, a, a jacket or pants that have the, the black and the green uh, pattern on it. And th that's also what we call camouflage too, because if they go in the forest, it would be hard to see them because they're wearing black and green clothes, right? So that's camouflage. And we have a video showing camouflage. Look at this picture. I'll start the video. Can you see the creature? It's like playing Where's Waldo? Where's, the, oh, wait, oh, there it is. It's a butterfly. Of course, when it opens its wings, right, we can see it easily because then it's not camouflaged. But when it closes its wings, it's a little difficult to see because it looks uh, like part of the tree bark. So that's a type of camouflage. Next word is skunk. A skunk is an animal that looks like this. It's usually black and uh, with white fur, black and white fur on it. And uh, you have to be careful around skunks. Joseph, uh, be careful. Uh, a skunk is a black and white animal that can make a bad smell. Actually, the skunk can spray. Uh, how can they make the bad smell? In their tail, they have these little um, ducks and they can shoot. They can spray this really bad smelling uh, liquid at people or animals, usually animals that try to catch them. Of course, a skunk isn't a very strong animal. And you know, if a dog or a wolf or a coyote or even a bear tries to eat the skunk, the skunk just turns around, raises its tail and makes a, it shoots a spray at the animal. And the animals, you know, most many animals uh, are very um, sensitive with their nose. They can smell a lot uh, better than we can, so their sense of smell is very strong. And when the skunk hits the uh, the animal, especially the nose, with that spray, the animal's like, "Whoa, I, no! I don't want to deal with this animal. This animal smells really bad." So then they run away, and the skunk survives. So that's kind of an interesting uh, way that the skunk uses uh, to survive, to stay alive. Okay, that's our vocabulary for this lesson. Lesson 3 Animal Adaptations Anteater An animal that has a long nose and eats ants. Tongue The soft, movable part in your mouth. Underground Below the ground. 
spray. To blow liquid into the air. Adapt. To change in order to be able to be successful in a new situation. Camouflage. An animal's color or shape that makes it hard to be seen. Skunk. A black and white animal that can make a bad smell. As usual, we start with the words, the vocabulary for this lesson. And the first word we have is producer. A producer is a living thing that makes its own food. So it can create or make its own food by itself. The opposite of a producer is a consumer. A consumer is a living thing that cannot make its own food and that of course all animals are consumers right they will they need to find other things to eat predator a predator is an animal that hunts and eats other animal there's a good picture right so we see a cheetah and looks like a wild hog or warthog it's chasing if it catches it it will eat that hog so the cheetah of course is a predator it will hunt and eat other animals. Prey. Now, again, we say opposite, right? Uh, producer, consumer, predator. The opposite of predator is prey. Prey is the animal that is hunted and eaten by another animal. In the previous picture, we saw a cheetah chasing a warthog. The cheetah was the predator, the warthog was the prey. In this picture, we see an owl. Owls are very strong predators. They're very, they're very fierce and they're very, um, well, like I almost said wise, but yeah, they're smart. They're very good hunters. And what are they, what are they eating? It looks like here, this is another bird. So they will eat birds, but they're also very famous for, uh, eating mice. And actually, uh, many people like owls around because the owls will feed on the mice or the rats. You know, the mice will, you know, get into places and eat uh, a farmer's crops or, or all the food in the barn or something like that. And uh, so it's good to have owls around to keep the population of mice and rats under control. So owl is a prey, a prey animal uh, and many different types, I'm sorry, an owl is a predator animal, and the prey is what the owl eats. Prey is an animal that is hunted and eaten by another animal. In this picture, the smaller bird is the prey. So that's nature. Okay, next. Hunt. We already saw this word with the cheetah. We saw this, the cheetah chasing the warthog, right? In this case, we have a cheetah who has caught a, a gazelle or an antelope. And that's what cheetahs and predators do. They look for or chase an animal so as, so as in order to eat it. So that's to hunt. And many animals hunt. People hunt too. When you have, uh, uh, especially where I grew up in the West, American West, many people in the fall will take their rifle, go out into the woods, and hopefully uh, they'll shoot a deer or an elk. Uh, they get a permit for this, of course. It's all very legal, and you can't go out and just shoot a deer without a permit from the government, but um, uh, they will hunt, and uh, hunting is kind of a way of life, especially in nature. So to hunt. Of course, we hunt for different things now too, right? And you know, if you're looking for uh, a great pair of shoes or a nice outfit, you might go to the shopping mall and hunt for your perfect clothes. Okay, so we use it for other uh, reasons as well. Food chain. Now we talked about food chain. I said, well, what is a food chain? I mentioned that at the beginning of this lesson. A food chain is a line of living things that depend on other living things for food. So we talked about uh, predator and prey, right? Prey 
You know, there's many types of prey and there's many types of predators. And usually the smaller or the weaker uh, animal it is, that's lower on the food chain. The stronger and, uh, and faster and uh, bigger uh, the animal, probably the higher up the food chain it is. So we have, pe we have animals on, low on the food chain and we have animals that are high on the food chain. Now this is an interesting picture. It's a cartoon of course and actually it's kind of a joke. Don't be confused by this picture because you can see something very strange here and I noticed that on the on the cover uh, picture. I mean it's, it's a cool picture but it's just kind of funny because if you notice this right here that is not an animal. That's kind of a joke. It's a fisherman's joke. Of course the fisherman it's a very interesting picture. This line here, of course, is a fishing line. On, on the hook, you see a worm. So a worm, of course, is very small and not very strong. It's not, it's a very weak animal. So it's on the bottom of the food chain. And then, of course, a fish will come and eat the, eat the worm. And then a bigger fish will come and eat the smaller fish. So the bigger fish are on the higher end of the food chain. But what in the world is this thing that I circled here? What is that? If you look closely, it looks like an old boot. And that's, like I said, it's a fisherman's joke. A lot, you know, when fishermen go fishing, you know, sometimes the only thing they catch are like old tires or uh, pieces of clothes. In this case, sometimes fishermen, like, uh, they, they catch something. They oh my gosh, I got a big fish. And they really work hard to pull it in and it comes up and it's just an old boot. <laughs> okay, so that's, that's kind of a, a joke or a fisherman's tale. And so the artist uh, put this boot in here with a mouth going to eat the uh, worm and then the fish is going to eat the boot. So of course that's not real. That, that's just a kind of a, a fisherman's joke in the picture. And when you think about it, the, 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 the animal that is on the top of this food chain is not in the picture. What do I mean? Well, here's the hook, right? There, somebody put the worm on that hook, right? So the fish will come and eat that worm. Maybe a bigger fish will come and eat that fish. But who eats the big fish? Well, that's the fisherman. The fisherman is at the top of the food chain because they're going to catch. They're hunting the fish and they're going to catch that fish and have it for dinner. Hopefully they won't eat the boot. Ugh. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's just a joke. Okay. Next. Caterpillar. A caterpillar is a small insect. I'm sure you've probably seen them uh, out and about in your garden, in the woods, in the uh, parks nearby your house. And they're colorful. Sometimes they're colorful. They have little, looks like hair sticking up out of them. Uh, the caterpillars, and they just kind of move along very slowly and they eat leaves. They're not very pretty, are they? They're just kind of like a big worm with legs. But after a while, they will turn into a butterfly. They will change into a butterfly. They'll make a little cocoon, and after uh, several days, that cocoon will open up, and a new, it, it's, it's the same animal, but it's a completely different, changed being. And it has wings, and it flies around. It's very pretty. Okay. Shark. A shark is a very large fish that has many teeth. And a shark is a predator because it has many teeth. It's very big. It's very powerful. And be careful when you go swim. Not, not everywhere. I mean, you don't really have to worry about sharks that often. Uh, just in areas that do have sharks, be uh, uh, careful about that. Know where you're going if you're going to go to another country or go swimming on the beach. Uh, just know, uh, you know if there's a shark warning or not. Most places, 99% of uh, beaches in the world, you don't have to worry. But some places you do. So just keep an eye out. Listen to the news or the local warnings. Okay, so that is a shark. Lesson 4. Food Chain. Producer. A living thing that makes its own food. Consumer. A living thing that cannot make its own food. Predator. An animal that hunts and eats other animals. Prey. An animal that is hunted and eaten by another animal. Hunt. To look for or chase an animal so as to eat it. Food chain. 
a line of living things that depend on other living things for food. Caterpillar, a small animal that turns into a butterfly. Shark, a very large fish that has many teeth. Our first word for the lesson is tundra. Tundra is a very interesting habitat. It's a very cold habitat. It's large, it means very wide. You can see forever. It's all the same. It's flat, not really a lot of mountains or hills or valleys, just flat land, very cold, no trees grow there, and usually it's covered with snow or ice. Sometimes in the summertime, it might warm up and you get some plants that will grow, but most of the year it's covered in snow and ice. It's a very cold and bleak and maybe a little depressing habitat, but many animals do live there, so that's tundra. Next we have woodland. Woodland, of course, is a land that many trees grow on because wood means many trees. If there's a wood, wood means forest, many trees. So it's an area of land on which many trees grow. Most people uh, live around woodlands in Europe, in Asia, North America. Uh, there are many woodlands and most, so most people live near trees. Of course, woodlands are a little bit cooler than jungles. Jungles are uh, like woodlands, but they are in hot, humid environments. Woodlands are usually more northern or southern, and they're cooler and not as humid. Okay. Habitat. A habitat, of course, I just uh, mentioned that at the beginning of this lesson. A habitat is the home of an animal or plant. It's kind of more of a scientific word. A more uh, casual or friendly word is home, right? What's your home? You could say, uh, well, my habitat is an apartment. Of course, that sounds a little strange. Don't say that, that you're being a little scientific when you do say that. So, but habitat just means your home or the home of a plant or animal somebody's home. Salt water. Salt water is of or found in water that contains salt. Okay, but basically salt water is uh, most of the oceans in the world, or all the oceans in the world, many seas are salt water. Why are they salt water? Because uh, the accumulation of salt, especially from rivers and uh, from all the runoff from the land, uh, that water has a lot of salt in it. And of course, there's also a lot of salt in the water naturally. So most of the oceans, if you taste the water, it is salty and you can't drink it. You cannot drink ocean water because it has too much salt in it and it's not gonna do your body any good to drink it. Uh, the famous sailor once said, you know, sailing on the ocean, he said, water, water everywhere and not a drop to drink, <laughs> right? So if you're sailing on a boat, make sure you bring fresh water with you. You can't drink salt water. Of course, the opposite, fresh water. Fresh water, we can drink. Whew, and fresh water is very refreshing, especially on a hot day. So fresh water is of or found in water that does not contain salt. And most rivers and lakes are fresh water. Uh, you see a, a picture here of a man on a, a canoe or kayak, and uh, he is paddling what looks like in what looks like a lake. And of course, many lakes inland in, in like the continent or inland, uh, you have a body of water, small body of water. We call those lakes, ponds are smaller. Those are fresh water. And most of the water that we drink, we get from lakes or reservoirs or streams and rivers. Okay. Moist. Moist means a little bit wet. 
Sometimes you have the baby wipes, you know, the mul tissue in Korean, mul tissue. Uh, mul, of course, means water. Um, and those are moist. They have, they contain a little bit of water in it. They're a little bit wet. So if you, if you just get a tissue, right, uh, cle like Kleenex, you know, that's dry. But if you get a baby wipe or mul tissue, that's wet. So the, the baby wipe is moist. It contains a little bit of water. Of course, it's much easier to clean things, your face or the table, whatever, uh, with a moist uh, tissue than it is with a dry tissue. You usually have to put some water on the tissue if you want to clean something. Okay. Coat. Are you wearing a coat? Hopefully not. <laughs> Hopefully it's not cold where you are. But a coat, of course, is either something that we wear when it's cold, but we can also describe the animal's fur as a coat. Coat is the fur covering an animal's body has. And of course, we, have a, we see a picture up here of a polar bear. A polar bear has a very thick coat. It's a very thick hair and, of course, a little bit of uh, some skin and fat that keeps the polar bear warm because the polar bear lives in the tundra in very cold areas. Of course, our dog, she's a beagle. I feel sorry for her in the summertime because she's covered in fur and it's very hot and humid in the summer. So she has a coat. She can't take off her coat. Poor doggy. Whenever we're at home and the air conditioning is on in the summertime, she's always under the air conditioner because she can't take her coat off. But okay, so coat, fur covering, an animal's body has. Okay, those are our words for the lesson. Lesson 5 Habitats Tundra. A large, flat, and cold area of land where no trees grow. Woodland. An area of land on which many trees grow. Habitat. The home of an animal or a plant. Salt water. Of or found in water that contains salt. Fresh water. Of or found in water that does not contain salt. Moist. A little bit wet. Coat. The fur covering an animal's body has. Okay, we always start with vocabulary. So our first vocabulary is continent. Continent. Continent is one of the seven land masses of the Earth's surface. There are seven continents. Can you name them all? Of course, we have Asia. We have uh, Australia, and it also includes um, New Zealand, so we could call it Oceania. Some people call it Oceania. Africa, Europe, uh, North America, South America, and is that seven? We've got Asia, Oceania, Africa, Europe, North America, South America. We're missing one. Where did it go? Well, it's not on our map. It's on the South Pole. It's called Antarctica, right? That is another huge landmass that is all along the bottom of your map, if you look at your world map. It's not that big, of course. <laughs> oh, it's just the, the shape of the map. Okay, but it is a, it is a big landmass on the South Pole. And those are seven continents. Continents, of course, are land masses. That's where people live. People and animals and plants live there. Layer. Now, a layer is a thickness of a material covering a surface. So, think about your hand. There is a layer of skin on your hand, and the skin covers the entire surface of your hand. So, skin is a layer. It's a thickness, and your skin has certain thickness of a material that covers a surface. So, whatever it is, you know, there is a layer of something uh, that covers the surface of another thing. That is what we call the layer. 
crust. Crust is an interesting word, okay? Now, I'm not talking about bread, okay? If you bake bread, you have um, uh, the, the bread gets baked and it's soft in the middle, but it might be a little bit hard on the outside and it's a little bit browner on the outside, depending on how you cook your bread. If you cook it too long, it gets black. But anyway, <laughs> the brown crust of your bread is the layer uh, around your bread. But the earth has a similar idea. The earth has a crust as well, and that's the top layer of the earth's surface. It's the outer part of the earth that covers the mantle. But the crust is really thick. Normally we talk about, you know, like the crust of bread is very thin, the layer of my skin over my hand is very thin, but the crust of the earth is very, very thick, especially in relation to us human beings, right? But that is the crust. It is in relation to the rest of the earth, it's kind of thin and it covers the mantle. Okay, we'll talk about mantle next. Mantle, of course, is underneath the crust. That's the inner part of the earth and it covers the core. So basically we're talking about three parts of the earth, right? We have the crust here, we have the mantle here, and then the core is here. And of course, the next one is core. Core, the center part of the earth. That's the middle of the earth. It's very hot. Nobody has ever been to the core. It's too deep. You can't, you can't dig or drill that far underground. Nobody has ever done it. Uh, in fact, the most drills that have ever uh, been done have really just poked little holes in the crust. It's very difficult to hit to the core, except for certain places on the earth. Okay, but that is the, the, we have the crust, we have the mantle, and we have the core. Those are the three main parts on the inside of the earth. Now, the next word is melt. If something is very, very hot, right, you turn it from a solid to a liquid. Now, you can turn rocks and metal that is very hard, and usually you think, you know, in, in the winter it gets very cold, but you can heat it up so much that it can turn into a liquid. I used to work at a mining company, a gold mining company, and to get the gold from the ground and to make gold bars, they would heat the ore and they would heat it so much that the gold would settle on the bottom and then they could pour it out in, into a bar and when it cooled, it was a bar of gold. It was pretty big and heavy, okay? So you can melt almost anything from a solid to a liquid. Depth. Depth is the distance from the top to the bottom of something. So if you're thinking this is a good picture, right? So you think about the surface is up here of the ocean. That's the surface. What is the depth? That is the distance from the, from the layer of water on the surface to the bottom of the ocean. Uh, of the ocean, the rock, how deep is that? What is the depth? We could also say, how deep is it? How deep? So we change the word a little bit. How deep is it? We change the word, how deep is it? And uh, that's an adjective, right? Deep. Um, and that would be depth is a noun. What is the depth? Same question. The distance from the top to the bottom of something. So you could say like the swimming pool is the deep end. Oh, pandero, the opposite of deep is shallow. Shallow. So you have the shallow end of the swimming pool, you can stand up, but then the deep end, you cannot stand up because the depth is more than your height. Okay, next. Above. Above is something that is directly over or higher than something. Now, this is an interesting picture. It shows the old idea of an iceberg. 99% uh, 90 of the iceberg is below water, 10% is above water. So the part of the iceberg that is above the surface of the water, we say it's above. And the opposite of that would be below, of course. So above, directly over or higher than something. And then, of course, our opposite word is below. Below means to be under something or lower than something. Of course, we're talking in relation to the surface of the water. So if it's under the surface of the water, it is below. And 90% of the iceberg is below the surface of the water. Now, if it's in this area, if it's over the surface of the water, it is above. Above and below, they are direct opposites.
Okay, so those are our words for the lesson. Let's move on. Lesson six: Earth structure. Continent. One of the seven land masses on the Earth's surface. Layer. Thickness of a material covering a surface. Crust. The outer part of the Earth that covers the mantle. Mantle. The inner part of the Earth that covers the core. Core. The center part of the Earth. Melt. To turn from something solid to something liquid. Depth. The distance from the top to the bottom of something. Above. Directly over or higher than something. Below. Directly under or lower than something. In the vocabulary section, our first. Item is actually two words. It is a phrasal verb. Soak into. What is a phrasal verb? A verb plus a preposition. So verb plus preposition is a phrasal verb. And English has a lot of phrasal verbs that、uh, correspond to a certain specific idea. In this case, we have soak into. Right? You could just say soak, but Into kind of gives it a more special meaning. It means for a liquid to move into something and make it wet. So if it's raining and the water soaks into your clothes, then you are thoroughly wet. It's not good. It's miserable, right? So soak into for a liquid to move into something and make it completely wet with that liquid. Okay. Next. We have another phrasal verb. Wow, <laughs> this lesson has many phrasal verbs. Here we have wear away. So wear is our verb. Away is the preposition. Wear away. Wear away means to cause something to become thinner, smaller, or weaker over time. So really, everything wears away. Right. If you have a, a a toy, for example, and there's a new paint job on the toy, so the paint is shiny and new at the beginning. But over time, as you leave your toy out in the sun, or maybe it gets wet, or as you play with it, it rubs up against the walls of your room, or、uh, the carpet, or the floor of your room, and over time, you know, the paint wears away. It becomes thinner. It becomes weaker, and sometimes the paint will wear away completely, and then you can see the metal underneath the paint. By the way, most phrasal verbs in English, preposition plus, I mean, sorry,、uh, verb plus preposition, have another more formal word that corresponds to them. And I should mention it for this word: wear away has a more scientific word that we. Usually use it's very common, and that is erode. It's one word, erode. And from erode, that's a verb. We get the noun erosion, and that's exactly what we are talking about in this unit. When we talk about wind, water, other forces acting on, for example, rocks. And the rocks over time they fall down, they become smaller, they become weaker, or the rock layer becomes thinner. We call that erosion. That process is called erosion, and we can say the rocks erode. But it means that they wear away. All similar ideas. Okay, good. 
Next, we have glacier. Now, glacier is a noun, right? Glacier is a large body of ice that moves slowly over land. Did you know that about ten thousand years ago,、uh, before ten thousand years ago, most of the Earth was covered with ice. There were huge glaciers covering large surfaces of the Earth. And of course, this ice moved very slowly. Of course, if the ice forms up high in the mountains, it will slowly move downwards、uh, because of gravity, obviously. And as it moves, it might carve. It actually pushes rock out of the way. And so, glaciers are very important nowadays. It glaciers are becoming harder. And harder to find because the Earth is getting warmer year by year. So there are glaciers, for example, in the Alps in Europe, but these glaciers are getting smaller. There are glaciers in the Rocky Mountains in Northern America, and also many in Canada. And of course, if you go to Alaska, you can see glaciers. Next to the ocean, but these glaciers are getting smaller and smaller every year as it gets warmer. Next, we have earthquake. I hope you live in an area that does not have many earthquakes. But an earthquake. This is the after effect of an earthquake. An earthquake is the shaking of the ground caused by the Earth's crust moving. The Earth's crust. Now. In the previous lesson, we talked about the three parts of the Earth, right? Crust, mantle, and core, and we said that the continents on the crust is moving very slowly. It's moving very slowly, sure, but it does move. And what happens is, when the Earth's crust moves, right, it might hit another part of the Earth's crust. There's many cracks in the Earth's crust, and sometimes the Earth. One crust will go down underneath one, or it might go over another one. Or sometimes they butt up against each other and do this. That's how the Himalayas were formed between India and China, because two parts of the Earth's surface were moving very slowly, but they're moving up against each other, and that's why the land is so high there. So anyway, sometimes when the Earth, you know, whether it's moving under or over, sometimes it gets stuck, right? Because it's rock, right? It's not smooth. It doesn't smoothly go over each other, but it will stick. And for many years, that pressure is building up, right? All this other rock is moving behind it, and it's just stuck because you know some parts don't move together very well. And then all of a sudden, that pressure is so much that something breaks, and then that causes a big shock wave. Especially at that area, and that shock wave is called an earthquake, and that's why it causes a lot of damage in certain areas. Okay, well that's an earthquake. Okay, volcano is another interesting feature. Remember again, we talked about the crust, the mantle, and the core. Now, in the crust of the Earth is very deep usually, but in some parts of the of the Earth, the crust is thin, and the mantle is relatively close. To the surface of the Earth. Now, remember, we talked about the mantle. It's very hot in the mantle, and part of the mantle is liquid rock. Now, that liquid rock is under a lot of pressure, and that pressure wants to be relieved. So, if it finds a way to come up through the crust of the Earth's surface, that will form a volcano, and a volcano is basically a mountain which lava. Can come out of. Remember in the previous lesson, I said lava is molten or melted rock. It's rock that is liquid. It's very hot, and this is a typical shape of a volcano. Usually, it has a flat top because inside there's a crater, and there are many cracks that the lava can come up. And you see the smoke because it's so hot, right? So that it creates smoke, and when it when it erupts. Lava comes out. Landform. Landform is a natural shape on the Earth's surface. So, if you go to certain parts of the world, like the American West or certain parts of、uh, deserts in China, you can see some very interesting、uh, patterns in the rock. Look at this. This looks strange, doesn't it? It looks like somebody, you know, the flat Earth somehow got tilted. How did that happen? 
Well, remember when we talked about, you know, I gave you the example of the two parts of the crust hitting each other and rising up and forming the Himalayas. Well, that pressure is enough to make the flat rock turn up like that. And then when water or the rock erodes or washes away, we can see the different layers of the soil that once were flat are now like this. And you can see that's a very interesting uh, part of geology, the study of the earth. And so you can see that uh, in many places in the world, especially dry places where the bushes and the trees and the grass don't cover the ground or the dirt, you can see it very easily. Okay. Next, we have a landslide. Now, landslides are disasters, right? This is when a large amount of rocks fall down a mountain or a slope. So again, you know, our earth is very big. There's a lot of pressures uh, on the crust of the earth. And as, you know, a mountain uh, which is made of rock or dirt, over time, right, things wash away, things erode, things get weaker. So the support that's holding rocks and dirt on a mountain slot, on a mountain slope, that support might wear away, and then all of a sudden those rocks or whatever it is will fall, and that's a landslide. It could be mud too. If there's a lot of rain, the the dirt becomes very wet, it has a lot of water in it, it becomes heavier. If it's on a slope, of course it gets heavier, it might suddenly fall down. And if there's a village or town down below, that is a terrible disaster. Sometimes we read about those in the news. Next we have erupt. I mentioned that earlier. Erupt is like an explosion, right? There, eruption. Oh, uh, erupt is the v verb eruption is the noun eruption so when a volcano erupts we call that an eruption it's when the lava and the very hot uh, molten rocks and rocks of course are also forced out of a volcano because of all that pressure in the mantle all that heat comes up to the surface and sometimes it comes out very violently with a lot of force and that of course is an eruption we have a video of that uh, check this video out this is a video of a volcano erupting look at how much power there is let's take a look so look it's, it's kind of looks like slow motion but we don't really see the lava or the rocks. What we do see is a lot of ash and a lot of smoke. And by the way, that can be very deadly. So if there is a volcano in the area, uh, you have to worry about a lot of different things. You don't want to be caught in that ash because it's very hot. It could burn your lungs. Also, if you're caught in it, there's not enough oxygen to breathe. So you could you know, you could die because you don't get enough oxygen. And of course, it's very hot. There's hot rocks being thrown out of it. There's a lot of lava coming out of it. It's a very dangerous situation. A very famous eruption in history uh, was the eruption over Pompeii, an ancient Roman city. And that eruption happened so fast and the lava came down so quickly that people died when they were running away from the volcano. And many people just died in their homes. Uh, they were just overcome by the fumes. And now it's a very famous archaeological site. But that's also, so volcanoes are, are very uh, terrible disasters, but they have also been present in human history for a long time. Okay. Lava. We've talked about lava several times already. So here we have the word. Lava is hot liquid, liquid rock. It's rock that is a liquid. Imagine that. It has to be really, really hot for rock to turn into a liquid. And you can see the liquid here. It's red and there's a lot of steam coming off it because any moisture in the air that touches that, it turns into steam right away. It's very hot. And in fact, you can see lava flows. You can see lava flows. That's what we call them. This is a lava flow. You can see lava flows sometimes in Hawaii. It's kind of a tourist attraction. Some people go to Hawaii because Hawaii has many volcanoes and the lava flows go down to the ocean and they create a lot of steam. It's a very amazing sight. So anyway, lava is a hot liquid that comes out of a volcano. Okay, those are our words for the lesson. Let's continue. Lesson 7 Changes on Earth Soak into 
for a liquid to move into something and make it wet. Wear away. To cause something to become thinner, smaller, or weaker. Glacier. A large body of ice that moves slowly over land. Earthquake. The shaking of the ground caused by Earth's crust moving. Volcano. A mountain which lava can come out of. Landform. A natural shape on Earth's surface. Landslide. A large amount of rocks falling down a mountain or slope. Erupt. For lava and rocks to be forced out of a volcano. Lava. Hot liquid rock that comes out of a volcano. Okay, in our vocabulary list, the first word is boulder. Boulder. When you say this word, it you you feel like something big and round, right? Boulder. A boulder, of course, is a large, rounded rock made by weathering. What is weathering? Well, of course, weather. It comes from the word weather. Weather is like rain. If it's sunny, that's a certain type of weather. If it's rainy, that's another type of weather. But of course. We talked about this in an earlier unit. Over a long time, rain, wind, snow, freezing, melting, can have an effect on rocks, and it can make new rocks. And boulders, of course, big pieces of rock、uh, that are carved really by the wind and sometimes by the motion of landslides and things like that. Rocks will break up. And they will become smooth because they'll wear away, and they're round. And we call these large rocks boulders. This is a really large rock, isn't it? That's a person standing next to it right there. So imagine how big that rock is. So of course, you know, boulders can be bigger than you know many houses put together. Of course, boulders can also be smaller, but they have to be a certain size. I mean, if you have a rock like this, that's not a boulder. But if you have something that's pretty big, it's Heavy to pick up, you could call that a boulder, okay? But a small rock, no, that's not a boulder. It's a large rock, okay? Next, we have limestone. Now, limestone is a gray-colored rock used in buildings. It's a very uh, uh, hard uh, rock type of rock. Of course, there's many types of rocks. Some rocks are harder than other rocks. Some rocks are very soft and will crumble. Easily, but limestone is very tough, and people will use it to make buildings because it's tough and it doesn't、uh, crumble or break apart easily. So that's limestone. Next, we have marble. Now, marble is also a very strong type of rock, but it is it can also be a very beautiful type of rock. It's a hard rock that is shiny when cut. And polished. So usually people will cut like sheets of marble. If they find marble, of course it's just rock underground, or sometimes it's exposed because of the weather. But when people will find that, they will they will make it's kind of like a mine, but they call it a quarry, a quarry. And what they do is they they will go in, they will cut like. Pieces of rock, and you can cut like square or rectangular slabs of marble, and then you can use that in your building. A lot of people like to have marble countertops in their kitchen, and of course, there are many different types, many different colors, designs, and so. And when you polish them, they look very beautiful.、And、of course, they're very strong and and resistant. So when you know somebody's in the kitchen and cutting and cooking and banging pots and pans, it doesn't hurt the marble. So many people like to use marble in their kitchen on top of their countertops. Okay. 
Next, we have mineral. There are many minerals, and minerals are found in rocks. They are useful substances. Use, we, minerals are useful substances. If it's useful, it's a type of mineral that is formed naturally in the ground, just like rocks. Okay, so minerals are different types of useful substances found in the ground. What kinds of minerals are there? Well, we'll, we'll find out more in the lesson, but there are many different types. Graphite. Graphite is a type of mineral. Now, what do we use graphite for? Well, first of all, it's soft, it's black, and it, it, it's not a hard rock. If you put some pressure on it, little pieces of it will break off. And in fact, it's very useful when you think about it because if you have a piece of graphite, you can put wind, oh, you can put wind, you can put wood around it so you hold it and the graphite doesn't mark your fingers. But if the little piece of graphite is sticking out at the end, that of course is a pencil and you can write with it. So when you write with a pencil, you're actually rubbing part of the graphite, that mineral, onto the paper and it stays onto the paper. Right? So it's a very useful mineral, obviously, for writing notes or to write messages to other people. And of course, we use those in pencils. And also, uh, what, you, what you call, um, uh, what, what do they say, uh, click pen or uh, we call it a mechanical pencil. I forgot what uh, uh, many people sometimes call it, but it's a mechanical pencil when you have just a little thin piece of graphite and you put it into a, it's like a machine, a pencil, and then you just click the button and it pushes the pencil or the graphite out as you write. Okay, so that would be a mechanical pencil as well. Next we have quartz. Now quartz is another type of min mineral and it's a hard mineral that is white, or colorless. It's, it's actually kind of uh, nice looking. Many people will use quartz to decorate things, but we also use quartz to do something else. And we'll talk about that in the reading passage. Okay, so that's quartz. And quartz is a very interesting rock, right? It forms these crystals. Now, many minerals will form what we call crystals. Right? And it's the chemical, it's, it's the way the molecular structure, now I'm getting too deep here, but the molecular structure of the mineral will form itself in a certain way to make a crystal. And that's what we have here. We have quartz crystals in this rock. Okay. Concrete. Concrete is a hard building material made using limestone. So actually the Romans were very famous for uh, using and developing this technology. They would use, they would make concrete. They even had concrete that they could make underwater to build many of the amazing buildings that the Roman Empire built, both in their city of Rome, but also in uh, you know the aqueducts and other many other cities in their empire. They used concrete to build their buildings, the hard building material, and they could shape it. The nice thing about concrete is that you can shape it into the shape that you want. It's wet at first and you pour it. It's like a liquid, but a very heavy liquid. You pour it into a, a shape and then it gets hard and then you can use that for bricks or columns or really anything uh, to make your building with. So uh, it's a very useful uh, building material. Next we have carve. Carve means to make something by cutting into it. And usually people will cut into wood or stone. Of course, if you cut into wood, you just need a, a sharp knife. And be careful, obviously, if you're going to carve a figure. Some people like to carve little animals or little people out of pieces of wood. You could also carve a, a walking stick. You can make interesting designs with a knife on a piece of wood. But if you cut stone, you can't use a knife, right? You have to use a hammer and a chisel because a knife is not sharp enough to cut rock. But a hammer and a chisel has enough force to very gently carve away the stone. And you look, this person is a very good artist. They're very skilled because they, they know how to use the hammer and chisel to make very beautiful and detailed carvings. Okay, next. Statue. Of course, a statue is a carving made out of a rock, usually marble, but you can also make them out of stone, other types of stone or metal even. 
Well, metal is easier because you can heat metal so it's a liquid and just pour it into a form and then you don't really have to carve it. But anyway, an object made in solid material such as a stone or metal. And of course, this is probably a very famous uh, statue. It uh, looks like Greek or Roman uh, uh, era statue. Many Greeks and Romans uh, made statues like this of the famous people or uh, people who are in legends or myths, they made statues of them to remind them and it, it's a part of their culture. It's also a very important art form. So a statue and we can see many statues today as well of famous people. Okay, so those are our words for the lesson. Lesson 8. Rocks and Minerals. Boulder, a large rounded rock made by weathering. Limestone, a gray colored rock used in buildings. Marble, a hard rock that is shiny when cut and polished. Mineral, a useful substance that is formed naturally in the ground. Graphite, a soft black mineral used in pencils. Quartz, a hard mineral that is white or colorless. Concrete, a hard building material made using limestone. Carve, to make something by cutting into stone or wood. Statue, an object made in solid material such as stone or metal. Our first word in the vocabulary section is blizzard. Blizzard. Okay, it's a little hard to pronounce maybe. B, blizzard. B and L together. Blizzard. A blizzard is a storm with lots of snow and wind. You don't want to be in a blizzard. It's like the snow is flying at you directly. It's not just falling from the sky, it's coming at you directly from the wind. So a blizzard is a very strong storm where a lot of snow falls. So be careful. We have to be careful in a blizzard. A thunderstorm. A thunderstorm is very exciting, right? But be careful. Don't be outside in high places or next to uh, large bodies of water or uh, holding anything like a golf club, okay? Because a thunderstorm, a thunderstorm is a storm with lots of lightning. What is lightning? Well, you can see in the picture lightning here and here. Lightning is the really strong electrical charge that comes from the sky and sometimes it hits the ground. And when you see lightning, you should count. One 1,000, two 1,000, three 1,000. Then you hear right? And you hear a very loud noise and that is thunder. And you can tell how far a storm is by counting. If you see the lightning and then the thunder's right, right away, you know the storm is right on top of you. But if you count one, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, and then a few more, and then you hear the sound of thunder, you know the storm is far away. So interesting. Next time you see lightning, count. And then when you hear the thunder, you think, oh, it's far away. Okay. Tornado. Now, a tornado is an interesting storm. It's very dangerous, of course. We have to be careful about tornadoes. A tornado is a storm where spinning wind, spinning, spinning means to turn around in a circle. And in this case, a tornado is spinning very fast and it comes down 
from a cloud. So the tornado starts in the sky in the cloud, and it's not just wind that comes down like this. No, it's wind that's spinning really quickly, and if it has enough force, it will it will make a funnel and come down to the ground. We have a video. Let's take a look at it. Here is a video of the tornado. You can see the, the grass is kind of moving back and forth because it's windy. And you can see the tornado. The tornado seems to be far away, but you can see it slowly turning. And this tornado is kind of far away, so it's a little difficult to see. But uh, sometimes you can see like just the, the, the top part of the tornado. You can see it beginning to form as like a little bowl. And it starts to grow longer and longer until the, the we call it the funnel, grows until it touches the ground. And when it touches the ground, that's a lot of force there. And it's blowing things around. It's so strong, it can blow cars around. It can blow cows around. It blew Dorothy's house all the way to the land of Oz <laughs> in the book, The Wizard of Oz. Check it out. It's, very, it's a very good story. It's also a good movie. Um, but anyway, tornado is a very strong wind, and we have to be careful about tornadoes. Okay. Next we have hurricane. Now, hurricanes, what's worse, a tornado or a hurricane? Well, a tornado only lasts for a short time, but it can cause a lot of damage in its small path. A tornado has a small path. If you're like uh, one kilometer or two kilometers to the side, either way, and the tornado goes between you, there's no problem. But a hurricane is huge. And a hurricane lasts for a long time, like many days. When it hits land, of course, it, it, uh, it loses its power. But a hurricane can last for days. So a hurricane is worse than a tornado because it affects a larger area and it lasts for a much longer time. So a hurricane is a very large storm that has fast winds and lots of rain. But the fast winds are what we have to be careful of. And we've seen in the news about hurricanes, especially uh, in the past, that have really damaged big cities. Like there's a famous hurricane, Hurricane Katrina, which really damaged New Orleans and areas around there. There's another difference, though, between a hurricane and a tornado. Hurricanes happen over water, over the ocean or a sea. Tornadoes happen over land, okay? So tornadoes will happen in Kansas, Colorado, uh, areas where there isn't a lot of water, but it's just very flat land. And there's a place, I think it's in Oklahoma, it's called Tornado Alley, where tornadoes every year, uh, it, there's a very good chance for a tornado to come through this area. It's called Tornado Alley. But there's no water nearby. But off the coast, right, hurricanes form over the ocean and then they move into land and then they cause a lot of damage on the coastal cities. You don't have to worry about a hurricane if you're in Kansas or Colorado in the middle of the country of, of America because hurricanes, you know, by the time they get there, they lose all their power. So they get their power over water and they move on to land. So a couple of differences between hurricanes and tornadoes. A flood. Now, a flood is what happens. Hurricanes cause flood because there's a lot of rain coming down and there's a lot of wind and it pushes, sometimes it pushes the seawater into a low area. And of course, it's raining a lot, so it dumps a lot of water onto the area as well. So, a flood, of course, is a large amount of water covering an area that is usually dry. And we can see this, of course, in many cities, unfortunately, around the world. Bangladesh has a very serious flooding problem. They get a lot of hurricanes. I believe they call them cyclones over there. Uh, and because Bangladesh is very low country, there's not a lot of hills or mountains in Bangladesh. It's very low uh, near the sea level. So it pushes the seawater into the land. And also, again, it dumps a lot of rain. And so a lot of areas in Bangladesh are affected by flooding almost every year. And of course, many other regions of the uh, earth as well are affected by hurricanes and flooding. It's a disaster. Okay. Next, we have hibernate. 
Hibernate. Do you hibernate? Sometimes I'm sure you wish you could hibernate. <laughs> That just means to sleep for a very long time. Actually, it's to sleep all winter. For some animals, to spend all winter sleeping. Of course, when we talk about hibernate, and we're talking about animals. Animals only hibernate in winter. They don't hibernate in spring, summer, or fall. Only in the winter. Why? Because there's not a lot of food. In the winter, consider the bear in his cave. Bears are famous for hibernating. They go into a cave or somewhere underground and they sleep for several months. Why do they do that? Because the land is frozen; it's covered with snow. There's not much food for the bear to find, and it's also difficult for the bear, a large animal, to move around in the snow. It has to use up a lot of energy. It can't find enough food to. To replace that energy, so it just says, "Forget it. I'm going to sleep," <laughs> and it goes to sleep during the winter months. And then in the spring, it wakes up and it comes out. You do not want to be near a bear in the spring that just came out of hibernation. It's very hungry. Okay, so so the bear will come out when the snow is gone and it can find food easily. Okay, destroy. Destroy means to damage something so that it cannot be used again. Now you can damage something a little bit, right? If you hit something and put a dent in, for example, a car, you've damaged the car, but you didn't destroy it. Destroy is when there's so much damage that the thing, for example, the car, cannot be used anymore. It cannot be used again. It doesn't work, and that's you know if a car hits a wall at a very high speed, the car will be broken. It is destroyed. Okay, so yeah, be careful. Don't damage things, obviously, but、uh, destroy just means that to damage something so much that you can't use it again. So it's very severe damage. Okay, those are our words for this lesson. Let's move on. Lesson nine: Changes in weather. Blizzard. A storm with lots of snow and wind. Thunderstorm. A storm with lots of lightning and thunder. Tornado. A storm where spinning wind comes down from a cloud. Hurricane. A very large storm that has very fast winds and lots of rain. Flood. A large amount of water covering an area that is usually dry. Hibernate. For some animals, to spend all winter sleeping. Destroy. To damage something so that it cannot be used again. First word in our vocabulary is shine. Shine means to reflect or to send out light. What's the difference? Reflect means if you have an object and it doesn't give light off, right? But this is a black surface, so it's not very good. So let's say it's a shiny surface, right? And the light hits it, and the light. Coming from another source hits it and bounces back to you. That's reflect. But if the object, oh, now the object is sending out light. Okay, so in both cases they shine, right? Whether the object is sending out light or if it's just reflecting, in both cases they shine because you can see the light that is coming from them. Whether the light is generated there or if it's just being reflected off of that object. Okay, so to shine. Ring. 
I have a ring, <laughs> okay? A ring, of course, is a circular uh, shape, and there's a hole in the middle, of course, so you can put your finger around it <laughs> or inside of it. But, of course, in this case, we have a planet inside of a ring. A ring is the small pieces of matter that circle a planet. What famous planet in our solar system has a ring? Actually, there are a few planets, but the most famous one is Saturn. Saturn has a very amazing and colorful uh, ring around it, and it really puzzled early astronomers who looked at it in a telescope. Like, what is that thing? Does it have ears? What's going on? So finally they figured out it's a ring and it's just small pieces of rocks and ice that are circling the planet. Just like the moon circles our planet, except imagine the moon is broken up into tiny little pieces and makes a ring all the way around the planet. Okay. Phase. We saw that word in the introduction to this lesson. And what, what is phase? A phase is the change in the changes in the shape of the moon as seen by us. Of course, if you go out at night and you look at the moon, sometimes it's a perfect white circle shining in the sky. It's not giving off light, it's reflecting light from the sun, but still shining, right? And sometimes you go out at night and the moon is just a little sliver of light. Now, the changes, you know, when it goes from a full circle of light to no light and then comes back, we call those the phases of the moon. It, it looks like the moon is changing shape. Not really, it's just the, the way that the light is reflecting off the moon. So the changes in the shape of the moon as seen by us, because we're on Earth, right? If we were in outer space in a spacecraft, maybe we wouldn't see these changes. Depends on where we are. Okay. Telescope. A telescope, now this is a very expensive telescope, not many people have one of these, but you can buy a cheaper telescope uh, that can enable you to see really far away. So if your friend is on the other side of a very big parking lot from you, you can look at the telescope and they seem very big in the telescope. But of course, you can look at the stars and at the sky with a telescope. And this is a very powerful telescope which astronomers use to study things that are very, 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 very far away in the night sky. So a device that makes things far away look bigger. Okay. Next we have constellation. That's a little difficult pronunciation, right? Constellation. So four syllables. Constellation. Constellation is a group of stars, a group of stars which form a pattern and have a name. Thousands of years ago, our ancestors looked up in the sky and they saw these lights shining in the black of the sky. And as they looked, they said, hey, wait a minute, those stars over there, oh, those they didn't know they were stars, those lights look like a shape, right? What is that shape? And, the, and their imagination said, oh, that looks like a lion, that looks like a hunter, that looks like a scorpion, right? And so these shapes, they gave them names, right? A Leo, Orion, a Scorpio. They gave these groups of patterns, these groups of lights in the sky, they patterned them in their mind and they gave them names to represent mythical or legendary characters or creatures in their stories, in their myths and in their legends. And so we have a lot of different types of constellations and you can see them here. And many of them, of course, have names. And different cultures might have different names for them. Now, of course, that's just how we see them from Earth. If you moved to another star system, it would all be different, <laughs> right? Okay, or if you moved to another place in the galaxy, all these uh, constellations would change. It's only from our perspective on Earth that we see these shapes. Now, we have solar system the sun and all the planets that go around it. So of course we have the sun here and you can see the orbits of all the planets. We have Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, uh, Uranus, some people call it Uranus, uh, okay, uh, Neptune, and then we have Pluto. And I said before, wait a minute, that's an interesting point because nowadays 
astronomers do not regard Pluto as a planet. Okay, we'll see that in the uh, in the next section. We'll talk about the different planets of the solar system. So I'll touch upon that point soon. Lesson ten: The Moon, Planets, and Stars. Shine. To reflect or send out light. Ring. The small pieces of matter that circle a planet. Phase. The changes in the shape of the moon as seen by us. Telescope. A device that makes things far away look bigger. Constellation. A group of stars which form a pattern and have a name. Solar system. The sun and all the planets that go around it. Okay, let's begin with the vocabulary. The first word is charge. Charge in this meaning means to put electrical energy in a battery. Look at these batteries here. Each battery has some electrical power in it. When you use it all up, the power is gone. So you put it in a charger. This is called a charger. To charge the batteries, to put power back into the battery. Next, we have plug. Plug here is a verb, but it can also be a noun. I will explain in a few seconds. But plug as a verb means to connect an electrical device to an electricity supply. How do you, you do that? Well, you see this green part here. This green part, if we take it out and look at it sideways, it probably looks like this, right? I'm not a very good artist. I'm sorry. <laughs> and this is the wire. So this is also a plug, but this is a noun. So to plug means to plug the plug into this thing here, which we'll see later. We usually call it an outlet. But also, many people also call that a plug. So you put a plug into a plug. Sometimes, sometimes people will also call it a plug. There's another word for that that we will learn shortly. So plug can have many meanings. It means to put、uh, an electrical device into a plug in the wall so that your vacuum cleaner. Or your electrical device, whatever it is, your computer gets power. Okay. Switch. You can see switches on the walls in the room. Those are for the lights, right? A switch. Now again, this here is a verb, but it can also be a noun. This is a switch. But switch is also a verb. It means To turn an electrical device on or off, right? The electric device, your computer, is on or off. Where is the switch on your computer? Maybe it's a button. You push it. You switch it on. Switch it on. But it's also the device is also called a switch. So it's a verb and a noun. Okay. Outlet. Remember before I mentioned this is also called a plug. Some people also call it a plug. So a plug is on the end of a wire, and it's also in the wall. You plug a plug into a plug, for example. But we also call it an outlet. Outlet because it lets out electricity. Right? It lets electricity out. The place in your home where electricity comes out. 
You let the electricity out. It's an outlet. Okay, good. Next, we have turbine. Turbine is a machine. Wow, look at this machine. It's really big and it looks very complicated. Something like from a science fiction movie, right? Okay, but a turbine is just a machine. It uses water, it can use gas, it can use coal, it turns a wheel. And as we'll see in the reading, when you turn that wheel, you can generate electricity, you can make electricity. So a turbine is very important for making electricity. Okay. A power plant. Now, a power plant, there are many kinds of power plants. A power plant is a building where electricity is made. We also call it a power station. Now, if you notice this type of power plant, you see this very unique looking tower. That is a symbol of a nuclear power plant. They're using, <clears throat> excuse me, they're using nuclear energy to produce electricity. Other power plants that don't use electricity, that don't use nuclear power, don't have those. For example, a dam. A dam uses water to turn the turbine to make electricity. And that could be a power plant also. Okay. Generator. A generator is a machine that makes electricity. It's another type of machine that makes electricity. And sometimes people will use a gas generator. They'll put gas, like gas you put in your car. They'll put it into a generator to make electricity. This is useful in case there's an accident or a disaster and the power plant doesn't work or the electricity is cut to a certain area. Some people might have generators at their home. They put gas in it and it will produce electricity for their house. So that's a generator. Okay, interesting words, right? Let's check out the rest of the lesson. Lesson 11. Exploring Electricity. Charge. To put electrical energy into a battery. Plug. To connect an electrical device to an electricity supply. Switch. To turn an electrical device on or off. Outlet. The place in your home where electricity comes out. Turbine. A machine which uses water, gas, coal, etc. to turn a wheel. Power plant. A building where electricity is made. A power station. Generator. A machine that makes electricity. Okay, in the vocabulary section, our first word is pull. Now, this is a force that you can make. Pull means to move something towards you. So, in this case, the horse is pulling the cart or the buggy because the horse is pulling it towards it. If you take something and you make it move towards you, you are pulling it like a door right? A door will say push or pull when you go to a business, right? You go to a coffee shop and you open the door. Look at the door. It says push or pull. If it says pull, pull the door towards you, okay? We'll talk about push in a second. If it says push, push it away from you, okay? So those are our opposite words. Push and pull. So, if you pull the door, you pull it towards you. If you push it, you move something 
away from you. See, now in this situation, this girl is pushing the cart or the wheelbarrow away from her. So she's pushing it. The horse is pulling, the girl is pushing. Okay? So these are opposite forces. Okay? Pull and push. Next, we have bounce. That's a fun word, isn't it? You can bounce a ball, right? It means to move up or away from a surface after hitting it. So if you bounce a ball, you throw the ball on the ground, it hits the ground and bounces back up. If you go to some places, some fun places, you can bounce yourself, right? You can jump onto like a big air uh, container or tube and you will compress it and you'll bounce, your whole body will bounce back up. That's fun, isn't it? Right? It's a bouncing room, right? So, to bounce means to move up or away from a surface after hitting it. And of course, we like to play with balls, right? We throw a ball against a wall, it bounces back and we catch it. Okay? So, you can play tennis by yourself if you want to, right? Against a wall. Or you can play uh, uh, table tennis also. But of course, many people all like to play uh, uh, just with a ball bouncing it to each other or just bouncing it by yourself. And of course, basketball is a sport where they really bounce the ball a lot. So that's bounce. Okay. Gravity. Now, gravity is a force, right? It's a very strong force and it pulls everything towards the ground. A few lessons ago, we talked about the planets that go around the sun. Every very, every object has some force, some attraction uh, that, that attracts other objects to it. The bigger the object, the stronger the force. So imagine the sun is very, very huge. It's very big. So it has a lot of gravity. And that's what keeps those planets. Of course, the planets have gravity too. And that's what keeps them going around each other instead of just flying off into space. Thankfully, the earth has gravity. We are all being pulled to the center of the earth, but not too strong. Our muscles are strong enough so we can move around. Whew. But it's thankfully strong enough, it keeps us on the ground so we don't go flying away. That's not good either, okay? So gravity, uh, we're used to the earth's gravity. It keeps us on the ground, keeps every object on the ground. Next, we have friction. Friction is another type of force. It's a force between two objects moving over each other. Now, here I have to be careful and say moving over each other. In English, you know, if you have an object here, right, and the ground is here and this object is moving, yes, the object is moving over the ground. But this, if the object is touching the ground and also moving, but it's touching, it's also over the ground. So in this case, I'm not talking about this situation. I'm talking about this situation when two objects move over, when an, one object moves over another object, but they are touching. Not here, they are touching. Then you have friction. Here, there's no friction, right? But here, yes, you have friction. So they have to be touching, not just over each other, but also touching. Like the golf ball, right? The golf ball over the grass. The golf ball as it's moving, it has friction. It's slowing down because it's actually touching the grass. Okay. Surface. The surface is the top part of something. The picture here shows the surface of the ocean. Right? We can't see underneath the surface of the ocean. We only see the surface. It's the top part of something. My skin, we only see the surface of the skin. Thankfully, we don't see what's underneath. Ugh, yuck, right? So <laughs> we just see the surface of the skin. Okay, so those are some, those are our words in the vocabulary section. Some of them are kind of interesting, maybe a little difficult. Let's explore them more in more detail in the two ideas and the reading section. Lesson 12. Forces. Pull. To move something towards you. Push. To move something away from you. Bounce. 
to move up or away from a surface after hitting it. Gravity the force that pulls everything towards the ground. Friction a force between two objects moving over each other. Surface the top part of something. The first word in our vocabulary section is pulley. Pulley? What's a pulley? Well, a pulley is a device. When people say it's a device, it's, it, you know, it's like a simple machine or it's a, some kind of tool that you can use to perform some action. So a pulley is a device with a wheel and the wheel is here. You can see the wheel is here and a rope and you see the rope sticking up here, right, for lifting heavy objects. So it's a device to help you lift heavy objects, right? If this is an object to, that you want to lift up and maybe move somewhere else, you can tie a rope to it, maybe tie another weight over here, and then you can use the wheel to pull it up, and then you can swing this part, and then, then that makes it a crane. You swing it over, and then you can lower it down to where you want it. And that's what a pulley is, basically. A pulley is useful for for lifting heavy objects. It makes it easier to move them around. Okay, next we have lift, and I just said that, lift. A pulley makes it easier to lift heavy objects. So lift here is a verb, right? And it means to, to do something. To do what? To move something from a lower position to a higher position. So if you have something down here and you lift it, up here, you're moving it from a lower position to a higher position. So from a lower position to a higher position. And of course, it looks like this is on a crane, C-R-A-N-E, which is attached to a pulley on the crane. Then they're lifting it up. Okay. Wheel. We saw a wheel before on the uh, pulley, but a wheel, of course, is also on a wagon or on a car. It's a round object. The shape of it is round. And it's a round object on a vehicle, but it can also be on a pulley, as we just saw, which lets it move on the ground. Of course, on a vehicle, the wheel lets it move on the ground because the wheel can turn easily. It's round. It's very easy to turn this way or the other way, depending on which way you're going, but it's very easy to turn it, and as it turns, it moves across the ground. So wheels were a great invention many thousands of years ago because they helped uh, people a long, 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 long time ago do their work more easily, right? They needed to move something from here to there. Hey, if you use wheels on whatever you're using to move, it's a lot easier to move it. So wheel was a great invention. Wagon. Now wagon, in this wagon here, you know, there's many different kinds of wagon. This is a wagon that the pioneers used to move across the United States and, and in other countries as well. But a wagon, of course, is a vehicle with four wheels, usually pulled by horses. Usually, not always, because these are not horses, <laughs> right? Horses don't have those big horns sticking out of them, <laughs> out of their heads. So usually horses are, are used to pull wagons, but, you know, many different animals, uh, uh, animal power was very important, of course, before the invention of the machine, and different types of animals were used for their power, for their pulling power. In this case, we have um, a couple of ox, uh, oxen, uh, and of course, horses are also used as well. Actually, looking at this picture a little bit more, I'm seeing that the ox, they're not real. <laughs> okay, I was like, wait a minute, it's, that ox's back is very shiny. It's not, it's not a real ox, okay. So, but anyway, the, what we're looking at is a wagon, and we see the wheels are here, and of course, there's four. You can't see the fourth wheel. But a, a wagon is very useful, of course, for putting stuff in the wagon and then moving it from one place to another. Makes work easier. Next, we have a lever. A lever is another thing that helps make work easier because you can use a lever 
to move a heavy object. A famous uh, scientist once said, give me a lever long enough and I can move the earth. Of course, you'd need, <laughs> you'd need a lot more other equipment to be able to do that. But basically what he was saying is that levers, his point was that levers are very powerful. And if you have a lever that's long enough and strong enough, you can move very heavy objects, objects that you think that are not, uh, that, that are impossible to lift. So a lever is a long object used to move an object upward. Of course, you need a lever. This, this piece of board is acting as a lever, but you also need this to put the lever on. You need some point to, to get leverage to be able to put it on there. And of course, this has to be strong enough to support the weight of whatever it is that you want to move up. What does this look like, by the way? It looks like a seesaw, right? So you use a lever when you go to the playground and you use a seesaw. That's basically a lever. Next, we have a ramp. And ramps are very useful, especially for people who have difficulty uh, getting around. Some people, unfortunately, cannot walk, uh, whether it was an accident or it was because of the way they were born. And so, of course, uh, we should help these people. And you see ramps in various places in our city. In this case, there's a ramp on the city bus. A ramp is basically a surface. It's like a surface at an angle that connects a lower level to a higher level, right? So if somebody's in a wheelchair and they want to get on the bus, they can't use the stairs. So this is a good invention that helps them uh, on the wheelchair. They can just wheel the wheelchair up the ramp and get on the bus this way. Of course, we also see ramps at the front of every building. There should be a ramp um, to help people who are handicapped get into these buildings. We call this handicapped access. So ramps are very useful, not just for handicapped people, but also if you want to move objects, heavy objects from a lower area to a higher area, it's very difficult to try to drag them over the stairs. It's much easier to put them on a wagon with wheels or some type of uh, vehicle with wheels and push it up the ramp. That's a lot easier. And we'll see that idea later in the lesson. Okay, those are the words for the vocabulary section. Lesson 13. Work. Pulley. A device with a wheel and rope for lifting heavy objects. Lift. To move something from a lower to a higher position. Wheel. A round object on a vehicle, which lets it move on the ground. Wagon. A vehicle with four wheels, usually pulled by horses. Lever. A long object used to move an object upward. Ramp. A surface that connects a lower level to a higher level. The first word in the vocabulary section is natural gas. Natural gas is a gas which is burned for energy. Natural gas is an interesting word. I mean, we, we know what gas is. Gas is what you put in your car, right, to make your car run. But what's natural gas? Isn't all gas natural? No, it's not because the gas that you put in your car really isn't natural. It is uh, taken from oil, run through a factory, that produces gas that you put in your car. However, deep underground, there are pockets of gas. And when we talk about gas, I'm not talking about the liquid gas that you put in your car. I'm talking about uh, a gas like air. It's, it's like air. And it's trapped underground and it burns because of the 
uh, the chemical composition, it can burn very quickly. In fact, it's kind of dangerous because it can explode. And you might, uh, you probably have natural gas in your home. When you turn on your stove, right, you can smell. Actually, that smell is added to it, but you can smell the gas coming from your stove, and then you click on it, and then it it makes a flame, and your mom or your dad cooks food on the stove. Don't play with your stove, of course. I don't mean to encourage that, but that's an example of natural gas in your home, and sometimes we have to be careful about that because it can be dangerous. So don't play with that. But that's an example of natural gas, and it burns very easily. Okay. Next is the stove. I just、uh, explained、uh, about natural gas. You see the fire here? It's a blue flame. That what's burning? That is the natural gas I was just talking about. And of course, it's on your stove. Stove is a device that makes heat. For cooking, now many stoves are natural gas stoves. You could also have electric stoves that just use an electric、uh, coil to make heat, but most stoves will use natural gas. My wife likes to cook with natural gas; she likes it better than electric, but and it, it's it's quicker, and it's、uh, it's much more efficient. But、uh, yeah, many many homes will have natural gas stoves for cooking. It's a very easy way to cook something in your kitchen. Light bulb. Light bulb is a different type of device. Of course, it doesn't use natural gas. It uses electricity to make light, and it also makes heat. Right. So be careful. If the light bulb has been on for a while, don't touch it. It's hot. Of course, new modern light bulbs stay cool, but、uh, the older light bulbs they get hot. So they make light. They can also make heat. But that is a light bulb. By the way, bulb. Is what you call this, especially this shape, right? That is a bulb, and of course, because it makes light, it is a light bulb. Next, we have conductor. Conductor. Now, you could use conductor means different things for different situations. If you go to see a concert, you see a man or a woman standing in front of all the people playing their instruments, and they're waving their hands like this. That is a conductor. That's a different kind of conductor. The conductor here is a substance, a material that allows electricity or heat to travel through it easily. So, if you look at these, what's the picture of? The picture is is of a bunch of pots and pans, right? Those are pans. Pans are shallow; they're on the bottom. The pots are deep; they're on the top. So, pots and pans they're made out of metal. Why? Because metal、uh, is a substance that allows electricity or heat. In this case, heat to travel through it quickly. So, if you put a metal pot. Onto your stove, the heat from the natural gas will pass through the metal to the food, and it will cook quickly. If you used a different material other than metal,、uh, the heat maybe wouldn't pass through, and your food would stay cold, or the material would burn, <laughs> depending on the material, right? But metal is a good conductor; it allows heat and electricity to pass through it very easily. Copper. Is a good conductor of electricity. So, in the wires in your home, they're made of copper. We talked about this in a previous lesson because electricity can pass through copper very easily. Okay, so、uh, a substance that allows heat or electricity to pass through it is a conductor. Okay, and like I said, you can talk about different conductors, like、uh, the person in front of a, a band or the person who drives a train. Uh, they're a conductor,、uh, person who checks your tickets on the train. But in this case, we're talking about a substance that allows heat or electricity to pass through it quickly. That is a conductor. Next, we have friction. We talked about friction in a previous lesson、uh, when we were talking about uh, forces uh, moving across different types of surfaces. Of course, friction is the force that occurs when you rub one object against another. And when you have friction, right, you're losing energy. But actually, when you lose energy, that the energy is getting transferred from one 
object to another. And when that energy gets transferred, what happens? Rub your hands together. What do you feel? You feel, oh, it's getting hot, right? So that, elect that energy is being transferred between your hands. You're, you're actually creating some energy there because of the friction and you're heating up your hands. And that's why when it's cold outside, right? And if, especially if somebody doesn't have any gloves on, they'll rub their hands together to make them warm. Okay, so of course wear gloves if it's a cold day, but if you don't, you can rub your hands together to make them warm. Next we have ice cube. <laughs> this is the, it's like the opposite of rubbing your hands together is holding a bunch of ice in your hands. Now, ice cube is a small block of ice. A cube is like uh, a little box, right? Um, I'm not a very good artist, but let me draw very quickly. This is a, oops, see, I'm not a very good artist. Um, that's a cube, right? And of course, when you make ice, you usually pour water into a, a plat piece of plastic or metal that makes the water freeze in these small shapes. We call those ice cubes so that you can easily put them into your drink. So you can have nice cold iced tea, for example, or just ice water. You put it into a drink to make it cold because iced tea is not very good when it's warm. I mean, that's, that's a different kind of tea. That's warm tea. That's not iced tea. So if you want to enjoy cold iced tea or lemonade or just water on a hot summer day, put some ice in it. It makes it cold and it's very refreshing. That's an ice cube. But don't hold ice like that when it's winter or cold outside. That's not a good idea. <laughs> okay in the summertime, not in the winter. Okay, so those are our words for the vocabulary section. Lesson 14. Sources of Heat. Natural Gas. A gas which is burned for energy. Stove. A device that makes heat for cooking. Light bulb. A device that uses electricity to make light. Conductor. A substance that allows electricity or heat to travel through it easily. Friction. A force that occurs when one object rubs against another. Ice cube. A small block of ice you put into a drink to make it cold. The first word in the vocabulary section is split. Split means to divide something into parts, to split it up. However, be careful using this word. I mean, the picture shows uh, some bread, uh, looks like banana bread maybe, uh, that has been cut into different pieces. Sure, it's been split up, but don't say, please split the bread. That's a little strange. Please cut the bread. Usually when you split something, if something splits, it's, you know, maybe by accident, right? Something breaks and it splits into two pieces. But you can also say, if you do have like a pizza or a loaf of bread, you can say, let's split it up. Let's split it up. And usually that means let's split it up equally so that each person gets the same amount. Let's split it up. If you have to pay a bill, let's split the bill. You divide the bill into two equal parts or according to what people ate and each person pays for part of it. So you split something, you divide something into parts, usually equal parts. Okay, to, so to split something. Prism. 
Prism is、um, a piece of glass that can split light. This looks like a Pink Floyd album cover. <laughs> Pink Floyd is yeah, it's a very old rock and roll band. Good, good music though, a long time ago. But anyway,、uh, what they're showing here now, this is interesting, and you see this sometimes. Sometimes, if you look on the walls on a sunny day, you say, "Hey, what? There's a rainbow on my wall, right? There's all these different colors. What's going on? Well, probably the sunlight is coming in through a window." Hitting a piece of glass, and that sunlight—the sunlight here. This is what represents the sunlight. It passes through the glass, and that sunlight, that white light that's coming from the sun, gets split up into all these different colors. And we'll talk about that later. But what? This is a piece of glass. This glass is acting as a prism, and a prism can split light, divide light up into its. Uh, uh, elements into the more basic colors of sunlight. Okay, that's a prism. Next, we have filter. A filter.、Uh, well, here you could say filter is a noun or a verb. Here it's a verb because we see two. So filter is a verb. Here, but filter can also be a noun, and、uh, this is a filter. A filter. What does a filter do? It filters. Okay, so it's kind of the same idea. But anyway, a filter uh, means uh, to remove certain parts of something using a device like a filter.、And、if you think about it, we have many different filters in our everyday life. Maybe you're wearing a mask these days. A mask is a filter because it removes certain parts of something. Your spit. Or the virus that might be coming from your mouth or nose, usually your mouth, and it removes it and it and it prevents it from going into the air. Sunglasses are also a filter; they prevent harmful light from getting to your to your eyes. So the sunglasses will filter out a lot of the sunlight to protect your eyes on a sunny day, or especially if it's a sunny day and you're on a boat. <laughs> Right, so you get sunlight from the sun and also from the water. That's too much light for your eyes; it might be harmful. So the sunglasses will filter out a lot of the light. So filter remove certain parts of something using a device, and usually you want to remove harmful things. In this case, it looks like an air conditioning screen or something, and you're removing harmful bacteria from the air. Or it could be water flowing through there, and again, you're removing harmful bacteria from the water. A lot of、uh, homes might have a filtering device on the the tap, maybe in your kitchen sink, to remove any harmful bacteria or elements that are in the water. You don't want to drink those things, so you have a filter on your tap in your home. Okay. Next, we have block. Now, filter, right? We talked about filter remove certain things, but you don't block it entirely, right? When you wear sunglasses, you're not entirely blocking the sun from coming into your eyes. Of course, you still need light to see. You're just reducing it. When you filter the water in your home, you're not blocking the water from coming into your home. You're thirsty, or you need to wash, right? So you need water. You're just filtering out harmful things. But to block means to completely stop movement through or past something. That's what this man is doing here. He's holding up his hand to block the sunlight. Right? He doesn't have sunglasses on, so he's blocking the sunlight from his eyes. So he's blocking the light from reaching his eyes to completely stop something. Not to just filter. Filters a little bit, but to block means completely shut it off. No movement through. Okay. Drop a drop. Now, drop has different meanings. Here, it's a noun. A drop is a very small amount of a liquid. So we see these little drops, right, hitting the surface of the water. Of course, we we know the word raindrop. Raindrop. Raindrop are little pieces of water, liquid that fall from the sky. Maybe you've heard of teardrops, right? Little. Parts of liquid that you know somebody cries and they the teardrops you see them in little、uh, drawings of、uh, faces emoticons right you see teardrops somebody is sad right so those are drops drops of a liquid rainbow I talked about that before when we talked about prism a rainbow of course you might see in nature as well a rainbow is a curved line it's usually a, a curved line means like this curved not a straight line this is a straight line 
Rainbows, you never see a straight rainbow. That's, that's weird. Nobody's ever seen that. Rainbows are usually curved lines uh, of many colors in the sky. What's going on? Well, remember we talked about glass. Glass is a prism. If the sunlight passes through it, it splits the light up into many different colors. But it's not just glass. Water does the same thing. If sunlight passes through water in a certain way, it will also split the light. So after it's rained, right, there's many clouds in the sky. So after a rain, there might be a lot of moisture in the air. The sunlight is passing through that moisture and it creates a rainbow because the sunlight is split into different colors. Of course, you can never go up and catch the rainbow. Many people have tried. There's a legend that the, a leprechaun, which is a magical being living in Ireland, has put a pot of gold. They, they bury their pot of gold at the end of a rainbow. But of course, that's, that's just a legend, right? You can never catch the rainbow. You'll never get that pot of gold if you try to catch the rainbow. It's, it's just a story. It's kind of a funny story. Okay, those are our words for today. Lesson 15 Light and Colors Split To divide something into parts. Prism a piece of glass that can split light. Filter To remove certain parts of something using a device. Block To stop movement through or past something. Drop A very small amount of a liquid. Rainbow a curved line of many colors in the sky.